Namaskar and good afternoon to everybody. I welcome you all and truly appreciate your joining us today for the first address of Professor N.R. Madhav Menon Memorial Lecture Series organized by the Akhil Bharti Adhivakta Parishad. Adhivakta Parishad has been associated with Professor Menon even earlier when he has delivered lectures organized by Adhivakta Parishad in their pursuit of uh, sp spreading legal knowledge. Now, this series is to commemorate the death anniversary of Professor Menon. This uh, series has been initiated by Adhivakta Parishad, by, uh, which, where orations will be delivered by eminent legal uh, experts. We are privileged to have first of the series to be addressed by none other than I, our Attorney General for India, Shri K. K. Venum Gopal. Professor Menon, he was a renowned educationist, scholar, and the pioneer spirit behind the modern legal education in India. He was the one who conceptualized the five years legal, five years integrated LLB program in place of the earlier three year ones. Professor Menon is credited with setting up National Law School of India, Bangalore, National University of Juridical Sciences, Calcutta, and others. It was later the Supreme Court of India requested him to take over the responsibility of the first director in National Judicial Academy, Bhopal, where he worked till 2006 and then he retired. Professor Menon was member of Law Commission of India and several other expert committees. On his loss, Shri Fale Nariman, the eminent jurist, went on to say, that when a great oak tree falls, the forest is never the same. So Professor Madhav Menon is missed by the entire legal fraternity for all time to come. In this series, the today in today's uh, oration, the welcome address is going to be delivered by Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, who is the Vice Chancellor of Jindal Global University. Professor Kumar is an accomplished legal scholar with contribution in various fields of law, such as uh, human rights and development, comparative constitutional law, amongst others. He has seven books and over 150 national and international publications to his credit. Professor Kumar also serves as the founding dean of Jindal Global Law School and director of International Institute of Higher Education Research and Capacity Building. He has been associated with Professor Menon both personally as well as professionally. Now I call upon Professor Kumar for his welcome address. Professor Kumar, over to you. A very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I would like to first of all uh, thank and congratulate ABAP for um, taking this extraordinarily uh, inspiring initiative to honor the legacy of uh, Professor Dr. Madhav Menon. I'm also uh, very delighted that uh, Mr. K.K. Venugopal, the Attorney General for India, has kindly consented to deliver the first lecture. Uh, I know that Professor Menon uh, you know, and Mr. Venugopal have had a long association. And uh, uh, in so many ways, Mr. Venugopal uh, you know, epitomizes the vision of uh, Professor Madhav Menon's uh, you know, uh, effort to contribute towards institution building for nation building. So uh, it's a befitting tribute to Professor Madhav Menon's contribution to have none other than Mr. K.K. Venugopal himself, besides being a distinguished lawyer and a jurist, has also had ma made significant contributions towards le legal education, particularly towards, uh, towards philanthropy and the kind of institutional creations that he has made uh, is truly remarkable. Um, I believe that I would like to a uh, little bit talk about the legacy of Professor Madhav Menon. Uh, I want to start by saying that uh, uh, Professor Madhav Menon is uh, one of those human beings, uh, you know, that uh, is, uh, is once in a century person, I would say. Uh, the reason I say that is that uh, his contributions are uh, so remarkable that it has had, it will have impact uh, for multiple generations. And I think so. I would like to identify five major contributions of Professor Madhav Menon as, his, as a part of his legacy. First, I think the one which is most obvious, most dear to him, and most well known as well, which is that his uh, significant contributions towards legal education. Uh, one could write, uh, you know, uh, books about it, 
but I will uh, make it simple in the sense that uh, it was it is clearly uh, one could argue that uh, legal education before Madhav Menon and after Madhav Menon was never the same. Uh, he fundamentally transformed the landscape of legal education to recognize the importance of quality, uh, you know, teaching, research, and to reimagine the importance of legal education for building a society based on the rule of law and strong values towards promoting, uh, you know, social engineering, social change, as well as advocacy at the highest levels. Uh, such was his vision. And this vision was born not out of a, a, a lack of understanding of what was already happening in India. Professor Madhav Menon, having studied in India, having uh, worked in universities such as University of Delhi, and quite remarkably, even at the uh, Pondicherry University, where he wanted to make a difference, he went there uh, and, of course, went to Columbia Law School, uh, spent a year uh, uh, to understand American legal education, drew a lot of inspiration from the best of uh, developments happening around the world and came back to India and pretty much uh, led the establishment of the National Law School of India University, Bangalore, which indeed created a movement for reform in legal education. And today we have over uh, 25 plus national law schools and uh, such institutions that were born out of the same legacy. So the first and foremost tribute that we can make, and that's special for me as an, as an educator, as a as a professor is his singularly significant contribution towards legal education, which has transformed legal education. Uh, an equally significant aspect of that is it became a benchmark for institutions in different parts of the world. Uh, Professor Madhav Menon's contribution towards establishing the National Law School of India University, Bangalore, and many other institutions in that line inspired generations of academics and legal education uh, educators around the world, including in Africa, in Latin America, in South Asia, and in Southeast Asia, besides even some of the best institutions in the Western world. The second major contribution in my view uh, of Professor Madhav Menon is to recognize the importance of research within academia and how it can impact policy making, law reforms and institutional reforms. Uh, Professor Madhav Menon emphasized this within the institutional evolution of the national law schools, but also went beyond that and recognize the role of academic engagement and academic leaders in policy making, in law reforms, and other such institutional initiatives. Uh, he was very conscious of the fact that, uh, unlike lawyers and judges uh, who are normally busy with their own lives and looking at specific cases, uh, academics have a larger role and even a responsibility to look deeper into uh, legislation, into uh, you know, jurisprudence, into judicial pronouncements, and to be able to critique and to analyze and to evolve new dimensions and new perspectives. He brought that to bear to the evolution of legal education and uh, created an environment in which research could be flourished. That's a second major contribution of Professor Madhav Menon. The third major contribution of Professor Madhav Menon is in relation to uh, you know, working with, uh, you know, a range of people to advance the cause of social justice and mainstreaming what I call uh, clinical legal education uh, across India. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things that uh, even American legal education suffered from was that the clinical legal education and clinical law professors were almost uh, treated as pariah within the legal education system. Uh, Professor Menon was very conscious of this probably when he spent his time at, uh, at a U.S. law school. And so when he uh, evolved the clinical legal education environment in India, there was a very strong emphasis on treating uh, clinical law professors uh, just in, as in par with any others. And to also uh, bring in issues relating to constitutional law, administrative law, jurisprudence, human rights, these aspects into clinical uh, legal education and students uh, are working closely with uh, professors and participating in understanding uh, the gap between the rhetoric of law on the one hand and the reality of law. So clinical legal education and the ability of law to make a substantive impact uh, in the lives of people and to use 
uh, legal and social values towards promoting advocacy uh, within the classroom uh, involving students and faculty was another extraordinary contribution and that's something which resonates even today. The fourth major contribution of Professor Madhav Menon uh, is in relation to uh, the, the, the contribution that he made towards building law schools and creating opportunities for young people to come into legal profession with a strong idealism, sense of idealism. He took that to the next level when he realized that uh, the aspect of legal education can only go that far. And so when he took up the uh, chairmanship or directorship of the uh, Bhopal National Judicial Academy, uh, he, in fact, I would say, uh, recognized the importance on, and, uh, and the role of training and capacity building for judges. Uh, with all due respect to our judges, we all know the judges generally tend to be reluctant with regard to training. Uh, in fact, everybody seems to be reluctant about training because it seems that uh, people think that they know uh, enough and they are always, uh, you know, uh, the, the level of skepticism and reluctance towards any form of, you know, continuing education, training, capacity building is quite high in our country. And so, uh, Professor Menon was very conscious that I've had, uh, you know, countless uh, hours of discussions with him, uh, both when he was in the academy and even beyond. And he recognized the importance of, uh, you know, developing a strong and a powerful and an independent training academy for judges, wherein uh, once they come into the academy, they will, uh, let's say, stop being judges uh, in the sense of uh, wearing a hat to uh, learn and to share experiences. I've had the privilege to deliver a few lectures at the National Judicial Academy in Bhopal several times, and I was deeply struck by the fact that uh, Menon's legacy is still uh, reverberating there because uh, judges who come there are part of the training. They tend to be much more open about new ideas. They are ready to learn. They are willing to listen. And they are actually wearing the hat of learning that of the main and envisage. So the establishment and evolution of judicial training in India owes a debt of intellectual gratitude to Professor Madhav Menon for his contributions. And the last, uh, I would say, the fifth one is that uh, after he debuted office uh, at the National Judicial Academy, Professor Menon spent the last several years of his life, and that was uh, his uh, last part of his legacy, which is to promote continuing education uh, across India. In fact, Professor, uh, Mr. Venugopal uh, contributed significantly for that in establishing the Menon Academy. And uh, uh, he uh, traveled the length and breadth of our country. And every uh, week, Professor Menon would host these programs across different cities, not just in metropolitan big cities, but also in smaller cities. He, would, he, was, uh, he was democratizing the legal profession. He was uh, bringing in uh, lawyers from small towns, uh, from lower courts, from district courts, and to offer them uh, training and capacity building, uh, you know, giving lectures by distinguished professors, uh, senior advocates, as well as judges. And that gave these young lawyers, as well as others, enormous sense of confidence. And the attempt here was to make the legal profession more inclusive, more democratic, and that process more engaged with social realities. And that's a, a continuing uh, contribution. In fact, uh, in later years, Professor Menon even talked about how to make legal education more inclusive. He talked about the need for uh, in envisaging new uh, forms of programs that will look at the, uh, at the, at the periphery and fringes of legal profession, uh, you know, enabling a number of our young people to participate and contribute towards uh, you know, addressing legal issues particularly at the village, district, and more uh, rural uh, you know, part of our country. Uh, so these five aspects of Professor Menon's legacy uh, uh, remain the, a significant contribution uh, for that. But lastly, I will say that uh, besides these five major contributions uh, that Professor Menon has said, uh, had done, uh, first in legal education, uh, second in relation to clinical programs, uh, third in research, fourth in uh, judicial training and capacity building, and fifth in continuing legal education for lawyers. Uh, he is also somebody uh, who has constantly uh, reinvented himself, did not hesitate to recognize uh, some of the mistakes he might have made. All of us make those mistakes, and he was prepared to publicly acknowledge that and change course. Uh, he was ready to learn and relearn and to never to be, uh, you know, uh, let's say, um, uh, reluctant uh, 
uh, to uh, borrow experiences from different institutions in different parts of the world. So in that sense, he's a remarkable teacher, uh, an inspiring learner, and most importantly, a, 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 a true, uh, you know, a generous human being uh, who, uh, who inspired every life he touched along his journey. So I want to end by saying that uh, Professor Menon's contributions uh, towards uh, the growth and evolution of law and justice in all its forms and manifestations from the standpoint of students, uh, you know, lawyers, judges, and others uh, who are engaged with law uh, remain an unparalleled uh, contribution uh, in the history of Indian uh, legal thought and legal education, legal profession. So I'm very delighted that uh, ABAP has chosen uh, to honor his legacy, and we can only hope that some of the contributions that he made, we will take it forward uh, in our own uh, future contributions. Uh, thank you very much. After, after thanking Professor Kumar for a wonderful lecture, we now move on with the keynote address by um, Shri K.K. Venugopal, who's been decorated with Padma Bhushan in 2002 and Padma Vibhushan in 2015. Shri K.K. Venugopal, sir, has also been a recipient of Grand Cross Award from Bar Association of Colombia and has been awarded several other, uh, have been given several other awards by National and International Bar Association. He has also been conferred Lifetime Achievement Award by US India Business Council in 2012. His tremendous contribution in development of law in his five decades of law practice, more than five decades of law practice, he has also to be credited with a unique gesture of converting his rare book collection into a public online library. Around 570 rare books, some of which date back to prior to 17th century, have been digitally scanned and uploaded to a website, which is available for public at large. This indeed is an extremely noble gesture on the part of Shri K.K. Venugopal, sir. We now begin the keynote address. However, if anybody has any questions, you are requested to kindly message them. And uh, sir, Shri K.K. Venugopal, sir, will address the questions at the end of the uh, end of his address. So over to sir. Uh, thank you, Sunya Mathur. Let me know. Uh, address you on the topic, but before that, I have to pay homage to the memory of Dr. Inar Madhavanan because he was a friend and I have known him for 40 years. And uh, during this period, we have interacted on more than one occasion. I wanted to start a law university, a national law university in Kerala, and uh, he and I together met the chief minister Anthony, and uh, a bill was uh, printed, but finally the government changed and the new government, the communist government, shot it down. Otherwise, I'd given them a very big uh, amount uh, to show that they were seriously interested in the whole thing. And thereafter, uh, the bill came around when I wanted to start a continuing uh, an academy for continuing education in Kochi, in my father's name. And uh, the condition which I laid down when the Kerala Bar Council approached me was uh, it is only if uh, Dr. Anar Madhavanan agreed to be the director that I would embark upon that and uh, uh, fund the project. I funded the project. I spoke to Dr. Madhavanan. He was very happy to agree. And for three years, he ran it as a very successful institution. Young lawyers came from all over India. The faculty was uh, consisted of uh, academics uh, of high repute and also judges. And it was a very successful endeavor. Till unfortunately, he passed away in May of 2019. He spoke to me a few days before he passed away. He was telling me as to, he knew that uh, he was uh, facing his uh, end and he told me as to what exactly he wanted me to do with the academy to make it continue. But unfortunately, we were not able to find anybody 
of his status, who would be able to manage it, and I was not able to pursue the matter. The academy is still there. The Kerala Bar Council would have to run it. I don't know whether they have uh, been able to resuscitate it or not. But I think a great giant in the legal field has passed away. It's our misfortune. Now, let me come to this uh, topic, which is the contours of, uh, uh, or before that, I should congratulate uh, the Akhil Bharti Adhivakta Parishad for uh, having this series of lectures in the name of uh, Dr. N. R. Madhavan, who richly deserves it. The topic is uh, uh, the uh, contours of uh, judicial review. And therefore, I let us start by looking at the definition of uh, judicial review. And that says judicial review, and this is a Black's Law Dictionary, is a court's inherent power to review the action of the other branches of the government. And in particular, and this is important, to invalidate legislative and executive action as being unconstitutional. That I think in a democracy with a written constitution, which uh, is quasi federal in nature, this is the real powers which a superior court in the country should possess. And for this purpose, we have to find out as to what the constitution provides for. And the constitution, as you know, have brought into existence the three, the three great uh, departments of government. That is, so far, so far as uh, uh, the uh, this is going to be, I think something is coming on the, the three great departments of government, which is the uh, legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. And these are brought into existence as equal and coordinate departments of government. And we have what is known as the separation of powers, which is part of a democratic constitution of this nature. And this would mean that the legislature cannot uh, en uh, encroach upon the powers of the judiciary, vice versa. Executive cannot uh, again uh, 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 encroach upon the power of the legislature or the judiciary and vice versa. Now the question is, in this scenario, to what extent could the judiciary look into the validity of laws made by parliament and the legislatures of the states? And this meant, meant that from the early years of the constitution, there was a confrontation between the Supreme Court of India on the one hand and the executive and parliament and the legislatures on the other. Because India is a socialistic country, the legislatures as well as parliament had to pass laws which were intended for the common man. And that was what the preamble of the constitution required. And this meant that the state legislatures had to pass land reforms so far as uh, the center was concerned, they had to nationalize industries so that uh, so far as the uh, workers were concerned, they would be empowered. The land would go to the tiller of the soil. Zamindaris would be abolished. But even though this is what I believe the constitution wanted the executive to do, the judiciary thought otherwise. Time after time, they struck down land reform laws. Time after time, they neutralized the nationalization of industries, though articles 339B and C of the Constitution mandated this. What would the uh, government do? What would the executive do? They passed an amendment first in regard to the first striking law. And similarly, time after time, up to 20 amendments in the Constitution of India by 1966. While, well, so far as its 200 years were concerned, of the existence of the Constitution of the United States, only about uh, 16 uh, amendments have been made. We did 20 amendments, and today, of course, uh, 
this past century and uh, won uh, far more amendments. Now, the judiciary was not prepared to keep quiet. And what they did was, in the Golaknath case, through the power of judicial review, they held that the power to amend the constitution should be found in the words of Article 378, 368. But 368 was only procedural. That power was not there. Therefore, each one of these amendments was just ordinary law and not organic law. And if it was not organic law, it had to be tested against fundamental rights. And Article 13 declared that uh, these laws would be totally void. And in Golaknath, in one stroke, they struck down the entirety of the 20 amendments which had been passed. What would be the result? The result would be the zamindaris would be uh, resuscitated, re-established. The tillers of the soil will have to give up their lands. The landlords and the uh, uh, zamindars would get back the lands. And that would mean a pet chaos. And in that background, so far as the document is concerned, it very wisely did declare that the judgment would have only prospective overruling. Therefore, all these amendments, 20 in character, which were all saved. Now, therefore, uh, but for the future, it meant that, that so far as uh, the 368 is concerned, it could not be used for amending the constitution. Therefore, so far as Parliament was concerned, it had no choice. It amended 368, it amended Article 13, and placed this beyond judicial review. And one would have expected, therefore, that so far as uh, the power of judicial review is concerned, the courts should bow their heads to Parliament's uh, dictate. But they did not. On the other hand, they came Keshwan and the Bharti in 1973. And in Keshwan and the Bharati, a full court of 13 judges, that is uh, seven is to six, declared that the constitution had uh, built into it certain pillars of foundation, which they would describe as a basic structure of the constitution. And so far as this basic structure is concerned, it is immutable. And if Parliament were to make uh, amendments to the constitution, which shook the basic structure or destroyed it, then the court would have no power except to strike it down. For example, suppose this is a republic and they declared this to be, a, 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 so far as dissent is concerned, one leader, his children would inherit uh, the rulership of this country. That would certainly violate uh, uh, the basic structure. Suppose a parliament elected for five years were to amend the constitution and say that the life of that particular parliament with all the members in that position intact would continue for 30 years and no elections would take place. And these would be the members of parliament for 30 years. Would you tolerate it? If the Supreme Court said we have to uh, uh, examine these amendments as to whether they violate the basic structure or not. But so far as this is concerned, uh, this was uh, the last straw, as it were, on the camel's back. And uh, the government, uh, 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 the parliament uh, uh, responded. And what they did was, so far as they are concerned, they were prepared to take very strong action. They amended, uh, no, the, uh, the Indira Gandhi government declared an emergency. And during the emergency, they suspended Article 21 of the Constitution, Article uh, 19, and Article 14. And 21 means, declares that so far as uh, the right to life and liberty is concerned, it cannot be taken away other than by the procedure established by law. Therefore, if that was suspended, you have no right to life. And therefore, so far as the court is concerned, it would have the right of judicial review to decide as to whether 
the suspension of the fundamental rights and the right to life under Article 21 would be safe or not, would be protected or not. And this was a great opportunity to the Supreme Court of India to hold up its head and show that so far as they are concerned, they are not going to be cowed down by this sort of uh, uh, declared during the emergency, suspending Article 21, the very right to life, where if a uh, person's life was taken away by a police constable by shooting him, a neighbor, this man, even if he was threatened to be shot and he went rushed to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court will say, sorry, you can only give damages to the, the family. And it as bad as that. It is so gross. And there was one heroic judge who stood up, and that is uh, this Kanna, who was to be the next chief justice. And he knew that he was going to be overlooked. And he was overlooked. Just as three others were overlooked uh, when Keshavananda was delivered. And therefore, so far as this is concerned, the right to life was suspended. The court upheld the suspension and thousands of persons were, had been imprisoned, including the top leaders of this country, had been imprisoned during the emergency and uh, they had no uh, uh, relief whatsoever. And it was only when the uh, emergency was taken, uh, taken uh, or uh, repealed in, uh, I believe, uh, it must have been in 1979 uh, uh, or so. Uh, it is uh, then that 1977, 1977, it is then that all these leaders were uh, released. Now, this is the extent of judicial review which could have been exercised by the Supreme Court of India, but they failed to do so. But when the emergency was lifted, the Janata Party came into power and swept away the Indira Gandhi girl. They were totally wiped out. And this gave a lot of courage to the Supreme Court. And uh, therefore, so far as the Supreme Court is concerned, they started a new era of judicial activism for the purpose of showing that so far as they are concerned, they were uh, uh, going to be totally independent. And the post-1984 embarked upon a path of judicial activism through judicial review, unparalleled in the history of any modern uh, democracy. And uh, the, there was born a new real remedy, which was called the public interest litigation. And the PIL was one where, so far as standing is concerned, that is irrelevant. The parties affected who were supposed to be the different sections of society who were ignorant, illiterate, or economically weak. So far as they are concerned, they need not come forward. If any lawyer uh, saw their uh, conditions or any other NGO saw their conditions, he could approve the court for relief and the court would give, give relief. They would not ask you, who are you to come? Why are they not coming? They should come. And therefore, uh, this was a new era of activism where the PIL, the, 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 the PIL uh, remedies blossomed and we found good, bad, and indifferent PILs. It is true that a lot of publicity was uh, attached to any one of these PILs. And therefore, uh, you would find many of the PILs being fired, which was uh, uh, should never have been fired. And if we have uh, genuine fear PILs being fired, for example, uh, Hussein or uh, Khatun, which was uh, one uh, case which was fired, saying that a large number of under trials were still uh, rotting in jails, though so far as a period of uh, uh, maximum period for which they could have been punished had long expired. And in one stroke, the Supreme Court released a very large number of them, thousands. And uh, that, I think, is something which uh, uh, is uh, uh, to be praised. And the names of Usunera Khatum, Sunil Batra, Sheila Barse, and many others would bring tears to the eyes of people who believe that it was part of their faith ordained by gods to suffer at the hands of the government 
and its public servants. And uh, then came uh, judgment after judgment, which gave tremendous rights to prisoners and to various other uh, uh, sections of society. And the Supreme Court expanded its area of adjudication to cover every conceivable aspect of human uh, enterprise, dealing with the, the pollution and the Ganges, guidelines for adoption of Indian children by foreigners, forced prostitution of girls, devadasis, jogins, extreme poverty and starvation in Kalahandi, elimination of injurious drugs, maintenance of approved standards in drugs, management of mental hospitals, employment of children in match factories, police encounters causing loss of life, extra hazards, you name it and every one of these aspects. At this stage, one would pause and ask, is this not part of uh, executive powers? Is that not part of uh, legislative powers? Is not uh, the, the Supreme Court of India trying to take over part of the governance of the uh, uh, country? I see the, the fifth state, in addition to the three organs of state, I mean, uh, uh, they would also uh, be part of uh, governing the country itself. And today when you find during the COVID-19, the cases which are filed, I mean, uh, they uh, would shock, uh, say, an American judge or a British judge or an Australian judge or a judge, I think, uh, in any part of uh, the world that people are coming forward and uh, asking for reliefs. That, number one, uh, transport all the uh, migrants from uh, one part of the country to the other. Now, you say transport. Uh, I mean, unless you have an Aladdin slam and rub it, you can't suddenly transport. And is it not part of policy making as to what we've done? Feeding them and giving them, it is true that uh, one's heart, um, uh, I mean, uh, is pained by the fate. But then uh, it is the government which has been doing whatever is necessary for that purpose. And it's no uh, part. Now, uh, uh, the, the various judgments which have been issued covered the right to medical existence, the right to go abroad the right to shelter, the right to a speedy trial, right to pollution-free water and air, right to a reasonable residence, right to food, clothing, decent environment, and even protection of the cultural heritage. These are the vast powers. And where do you get these powers? The power of judicial. Where do you trace it to? Article 226 of the Constitution, Article 32 of the Constitution. Was it intended? I do not know. But uh, today they have used Article 142. Article 142 is a power given to mold a decree for the purpose of meeting the ends of justice. When do you mold it? You deliver a judgment which is within the scope of your powers given by the constitution and by the laws. And thereafter you say, or let me want to now uh, give him uh, the land was uh, sought to be uh, acquired uh, 40, 50 years back. You can't give him the 40, 50 years back price. Today, the price has become uh, 54. Therefore, we'll give him something in between. Now, this is to mold the decree. But instead of that, so far as 142 is concerned, that will use as a common That is a source of unlimited powers. And therefore, now they don't ask a question at all. As to where do we get our powers? You say that uh, there's a prohibition in regard to the consumption of uh, uh, liquor on the highway. Now, you say, no, we want it to be now shifted to 500 meters. Five-star hotels and uh, a large number of hotels that you close now, which are uh, within the 500 uh, meters, take the airport. Now, our airport and all that, uh, all the cluster of uh, hotels who uh, were not saving uh, liquor. Now, these are policy issues. Where does it uh, the, what is it? The uh, court know about the parishing uh, effects of its order. And uh, after all, they are not elected. They are not uh, having, they are not representatives. Uh, they do not have any uh, constituency to which they are answerable. And therefore, so far as this is concerned, uh, you have to have restraint also. Just because you believe that 142 gives you the power, according to me, it does not. In spite of that, they exercise vast, unlimited powers. And this, I think, uh, one should think about.
and the new weapon that in the armory is constitutional morality. Now, constitutional morality, was mentioned by uh, Dr. Ambedkar in quoting growth in totally different uh, context. But now they say, no, constitutional morality is inbuilt into the constitution. If you say, look, where do you find it? You will read the entire constitution and you will find constitutional morality, which is uh, invisible, but we will uh, uh, bring it out and then uh, use it. And uh, that, I think, has been used as a, a, a ground and a weapon in very many cases. Now, uh, I do not think that uh, they need any form of more uh, new weapons for the purpose of uh, exercising judicial adjudication or uh, even judicial review. And uh, the result of this constitutional morality we have seen in the Shabarimala case. In the Shabarimala case, uh, Justice Chandrachud said, Constitutional morality would require me to strike down the ban on uh, females between the ages of 10 to 15 from uh, 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 going to the uh, 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 going to the temple, Sabramana temple, and uh, which meant that all of them could go between the ages. But this is uh, Hindu Malotra said exactly the opposite. This is Hindu Malotra said. The constitutional morality would require that we should uphold the faith of the people of, uh, who worship them, namely that females of this age cannot be permitted. Exactly two opposite approaches and decisions based on one constitutional morality. Is this therefore something which is safe? Do you arm yourself to use it whenever you don't find any other good reason? And therefore I say that uh, it is time that they don't uh, go on adding uh, weapons to their, uh, 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 to their uh, 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 armory. Now, Alexander Bickel had described the Supreme Court of the United States in the title of his publication, The Least Dangerous Branch, that is the Supreme Court of the United States. But I would describe the Indian Supreme Court as a most powerful branch among the three organs of state because they are able to sit in judgment on those two organs of state, strike down their actions, strike down their laws, if they're so chose. The Time magazine in its issue of March 18, 1996, had quoted Justice P. N. Bhagavati, former Chief Justice of India, as saying, the Supreme Court today is the most powerful court in the world. Therefore, a retired chief justice was prepared to say that. And therefore, we should accept it as correct that the Supreme Court is the most powerful court in the world. Now, the article again proceeds to state that nowadays, however, Indians are less likely to rely on politicians for redressal of their grievances than on the Supreme Court. From garbage disposal to the removal of polluting factories from the vicinity of the Taj Mahal, Hardly any matter seems beyond the court's purview. Therefore, uh, it seems as if the court no more is uh, 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 bound by any limitations whatsoever. Though all the three organs of state are subject to limitations. Therefore, uh, uh, I have serious reservations about arming the court uh, with any further uh, powers. Now, let me tell you as to what our founding fathers thought of the Supreme Court and the vast powers that they were giving to the Supreme Court. The uh, Justice T.T. Krishnamachari, one of the very learned uh, members of the uh, uh, Assembly, he said, it might be, I'm quoting, that to give the judiciary an enormous amount, and this is before the Constitution was adopted, while the discussions were going on, they gave an enormous power to the judiciary, when, uh, uh, um, so and so, to give a judiciary an enormous power of power, a judiciary which will not be controlled by any legislature in any manner, except by the means of ultimate removal, we may perhaps be creating a Frankenstein monster, which could nullify the intentions of the framers of the constitution. 
I have in mind the difference that was experienced in another country, that is the United States. Sir Allah de Krishnaswami Iyer, a very learned uh, uh, lawyer, he said the doctrine of independence is not to be raised to the level of a dogma so as to enable the judiciary to, to function as a kind of super legislature or super executive. And B. N. Rao, the constitutional advisor, also warned the constituent assembly, the courts, manned by an irremovable judiciary, not so sensitive to public needs in the social or economic sphere, as a representative of a periodically elected legislature, will in effect have a veto on legislation accessible at any time and in the instance of any uh, litigant. Now, uh, it will fin finally, to conclude, I would say that so far as uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court is concerned, there is a learned uh, writer, Anirudh Prasad. This is what he has said. The judiciary with the power of judicial review had to cover a long journey, starting from judicial self-restraint to passing through moderate activism. Activism and now reaching to the point of juristocracy, literally meaning rule by judges. And this is a new phrase, juristocracy. Therefore, I believe that so far as the Supreme Court of India is concerned, it has done a tremendous amount of good. It has practically tried to wipe away every tear from every eye of the poor, the disadvantaged, and the illiterate sections of society. At the same time, they have, in very many cases, according to me, excess powers which can never be treated as uh, judicial adjudication or even within the normal bounds of judicial activism. Now, this is a matter which has to be thrown open for any of you who want to ask questions. I'll be happy to answer the same. So thank you very much. It was, an, it was an extremely enriching experience, and we are privileged to hear you, sir. Everybody who's heard you today is going to carry a true and a deep understanding of the subject which is addressed by you. There are some questions, that, uh, if I may just uh, place them before you. So the first question is, to what extent should judicial review be permissible so that it doesn't hamper with governance? If you ask me that question, the question answers uh, itself because the judicial wing of the state was not created for the purpose of governing the country. The judicial wing uh, would only test the constitutional validity of acts of parliament, amendments to the constitution within the limits mentioned, that is, of basic structure, of validity of rules to examine whether it is uh, ultra virus, the act under which it was made and whether the acts of government were violative of any of the fundamental rights. Therefore, so far as governance is concerned, it is far outside. Though, of course, many of the judgments which are received, which are delivered in uh, PILs, may, uh, may have the taint, as it were, of uh, encroaching upon the executive field. Therefore, uh, I don't think governance is any part of the uh, uh, function of the judiciary. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so another question, sir, how close are we to regional benches of Supreme Court? In case we have regional benches, what impact will it have qua the exercise of judicial review power between constitution bench of Supreme Court and the bench of Supreme Court exercising jurisdiction say, in 136 petitions? See, so far as uh, benches of the Supreme Court are concerned, each bench in any part of India would itself be the Supreme Court. And the advantage is that the Supreme Court becomes more accessible physically to the people of different regions. 
but then this distribution of uh, judges to various benches may perhaps uh, uh, affect the following of uh, precedents or uh, their cohesion by which they would form large benches to decide various matters. I don't know, but it's a matter for the Chief Justice of India to decide. And uh, I have been suggesting courts of appeal who will take away the large number of cases which the Supreme Court is now uh, practically drowning under. That is uh, master and servant uh, relationship, labor cases, then uh, rent control cases, then matrimonial cases, land acquisition cases, bail applications. No, no Supreme Court or uh, FX Court of any country in the world would deal with any one of these matters. These have to be subjected to uh, at a lower level. But at the same time, I don't think you can trust the 500 judges in the High Court. Um, but some of them may not uh, be so competent, etc., to decide cases correctly. And therefore, there has to be a review. And therefore, courts of appeal to come in between the Supreme Court, four courts of appeal in four different regions, which will be accessible to the people in those areas, which will decide finally all these matters. And the judges will be elevated from the High Court, just as Supreme Court judges are elevated from the High Court. Fifteen judges in each one of these courts of appeal. And that would relieve the Supreme Court. The total number of 70,000 cases would be reduced to 2,000. Judges would have leisure, and therefore they would be able to live, uh, read a lot of literature, lots of uh, judgments from various uh, other jurisdictions, and then uh, evolve also new theories. Therefore, it would be to the advantage of getting much better judgments than, uh, if they have more leisure. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so the next question says, in absence of power of judicial review, how is the balance of power disturbed in democracy set up like India? Is it in favor of executive or legislature otherwise? I think uh, the judges, uh, you see, in the absence of judicial review, the judges would have to decide on the appeals from uh, the lower courts or from the tribunals. And they would not be able to even exercise the powers in Article 32. Because Article 32 is a yeah, original power. 226 is an original power. And these would result in matters which relate to those repetitions which are, are normally the ones which under which judicial review takes place being uh, filed. And therefore, uh, I think uh, the, the democracy cannot function if judicial review is not there. It's an essential concomitant of judicial review in a democracy and uh, governed by a constitution. I think it's essential. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, the next question. Thank you very much, sir, for the answer. So the next question says, power of judicial review questions the legitimacy of law made by majority in parliament, that is having people's mandate. Therefore, is the concept of judicial review not anti-democracy? That is an argument which has been going on in other countries also, especially in the United States. The judicial review is anti-majoritarian. They say, who are these judges to sit in judgment for the laws passed by the representatives of the people who discuss the matter, and before the bill comes to the uh, parliament, there will be perhaps uh, a standing committee which discusses it elaborately and would take evidence also of people, of experts. And finally, a bill would be, a bill will be framed. And that bill would then be placed before parliament and debated upon by 500 or 500 and odd uh, members of parliament. Now, after all this effort, who are these nine people, 10 people, or 15, 30 people to sit and then go into the wisdom of uh, this uh, parliament, which has passed this law after such great uh, 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 effort and examination, research, and application of mind data. And uh, these are uh, unelected people. They don't have a constituency. They come from different backgrounds, which uh, 
maybe perhaps uh, very traditional backgrounds which cannot keep in touch with the modern uh, uh, views and uh, uh, modern uh, 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 whatever is uh, to be looked into by the society today. And therefore, their social interests cannot be entrusted to these 30 persons or uh, the judges in the high court. This is one of the arguments which is going on. But I believe that so far as uh, the political wing of the state is concerned, is very vulnerable because uh, they have constituencies to which they have to uh, do favors. You are elected by a particular uh, group. Therefore, you've got to return something to them which may not be within uh, uh, legitimate powers which are given to you. Therefore, you exceed those powers. Somebody has to sit in judgment. Therefore, uh, according to me, so far as this anti-majoritarianism is concerned, that is a very attractive argument, but uh, that is not, I think, feasible, especially in our country, where you find uh, different political uh, 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 groups taking uh, different views and acting uh, perhaps not constitutionally. If you look at the judgments of the Supreme Court, there are so many cases I have said that the reforms which they have uh, sought to be brought about. Now, the Supreme Court is, was extremely worried about the prisoners being packed into rooms uh, like sardines in the jails all over the country. They said, what will happen to COVID if one person gets it, all of them will get it. And therefore, you have got to get rid of and uh, uh, distance uh, the prisoners. And therefore, they pass orders by which uh, a high, cover, high power committee headed by the chief, uh, chief secretary of each one of the states was to decide upon who are the prisoners to be sent out. So on uh, probation with uh, undertakings that uh, you will bring them back. And therefore, this was done and uh, a large number of prisoners were 50, 60,000 of them. Yes. Now, uh, to prevent them from falling sick to COVID. Now, these are things which uh, the, the Supreme Court thinks of. Every day they are able to do some good. <coughs> Therefore, I think that uh, uh, it is uh, anti majoritarianism uh, uh, is not uh, a welcome thought today. Thank you very much, sir. So, the next question, according to me, is partially answered by you, but I will nonetheless read it. Does the power of judicial review not make judiciary more powerful than parliament? And the law made by the mandate of people are set aside by non-elected judges. Is it not anti-democracy? No, it is true. But uh, there is no choice. Because uh, constitutionally, each one of these departments of state was, as I said, equal and coordinate. Therefore, uh, nothing, none among them is more powerful than the other one. But in practice, the power given to the judiciary itself is to test the validity of the laws made by parliament by testing it against the constitution. And who is the final interpreter of the constitution? The judiciary. Now, therefore, the fact that only a few persons are sitting there in judgment would uh, not make any difference. But what you have to ensure is that the quality of the judges, their integrity and uh, their knowledge and experience all this should be of the highest level possible. Therefore, you don't appoint anybody and everybody as judges of the High Court and then the Supreme Court based on pure seniority. There has to be uh, a calculated uh, 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 search done to get the best. And after looking at all the judgments delivered by the judges in the High Court, to see as to how good their judgments are, and then alone select. I'm sorry that nothing like that is happening today. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, before I go to the final question, which has been asked, may I ask a personal question, which is from my side? I just wanted to know, sir, what is the thought behind and what is it that inspired you to convert your private library into a public library online? See, I'm an old man. I'm 88 years old. Therefore, what's the use of my leaving it in cold storage in my house? Therefore, I decided that these are books which I've been collecting over the last about 20 years. And they are uh, books which are published in 1634, 1676, 
and so on. Now, the, there are 588 books in the uh, Antigarian Library today. I'm going to add another 500 books which are published before 1900. And they deal with every topic under the sun, including cookery books published in uh, 1870 and so on. And therefore, I want the people to share it with me so that uh, there is no use in keeping it uh, <laughs> enclosed in my head, uh, in a room in the house. And therefore, uh, I would like the people to use it, especially for research. The number of books are there uh, dealing with uh, India, it's, it's fight for freedom and so on. Uh, and uh, the uh, so-called, uh, they call it a mutiny, we call it the first war of independence, 1857. If you take uh, the, uh, the illustrated London news of 1857, you will find pictures when Lucknow was recaptured by the British, they bayoneted women and children who were there uh, hiding in the fort, Indian, uh, 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 who, the wives of the Sipais and all that. And thereafter, the Sipais were all captured, put into the muzzles of guns, and then they were fired or tied to the mouth of guns and fired, and you will see pictures of the bodies flying. I mean, these are things which you won't find uh, anywhere, or uh, unless you do research. Then uh, there are uh, uh, interviews uh, where uh, a law lord, no, I'm sorry, where uh, an aristocratic gentleman uh, interviews the Nawab of Oud, and he says when he was a child, he found that his sisters who were born were put into gunny bags and drowned in the Ganges. Now, how do you examine that? And then he gives stories of another Nawab. When he died, it appears that seven of his widows were thrown into the fire along with him. And in another case, out of 13 widows, about three were his wives, and the rest of them were concubines. And all of them were forced to commit self immolation in Sati. Now, all these uh, are described in great detail. And uh, therefore, uh, these are matters of research. And I wanted people to research and use it uh, for writing articles. You take any book, you can write three articles, uh, which are extremely interesting. Thank you so much, sir. That is so noble and so commendable, sir. It certainly is a treasure which has become open to all of us. And we can never be grateful enough for you with, uh, to you for this. So the uh, final question is, any message for the young lawyers who are in litigation to guide them through their journey? It depends upon which branch they take. Whichever is the branch, that is, uh, whether it is criminal or civil or uh, constitutional or uh, whatever it is. Today, we have got tremendous opportunities. There has been a decentralization of power by the courts and uh, transfer of all these, uh, uh, most of the subjects to various tribunals and any number of tribunals uh, exist. Now, therefore, uh, the opportunities today are very great. And uh, you have actually Italy, the law firms where they are having a vast amount of uh, work, uh, international uh, work. Therefore, lawyers today have uh, excellent uh, opportunities. Only thing is that in the first years, those who pass out from the national law schools and by find uh, are able to stand on their feet immediately after they pass out and argue cases because they have the moot courts, they have the seminars, they have the uh, internships and so on. Now, uh, yeah, I, been, I think all the law colleges should have been brought up to the same standard. And that is where the Bar Council of India has to ensure that uh, the standard of uh, quality of uh, uh, teaching is very high. Now, in which case the lawyers should be able to earn uh, a sufficient amount of money immediately after they pass out. Or there has to be a rule by which the seniors have to take lawyers at least two juniors each from the newly passed out uh, members of the uh, uh, bar who have just passed out and to keep them for three years at least, so that they find their feet. Therefore, today you have got tremendous opportunities. 
in the Supreme Court, look at the number of cars which are parked, and we find thousands of cars of the latest models, and therefore, uh, this is a flourishing business. And that is why there is so much of competition to get into the law colleges, including especially the national law schools. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. And for this has really been a privilege and extremely enriching experience for all of us. Now, sir, this the series is to commemorate the death anniversary of Professor Madhav Menon, and it is as a tribute to him. Now, just to add to uh, whatever has been said by you and by Professor Kumar, uh, there is a comment which has come from uh, Professor Singh. If I if I can just read that for the benefit of everybody as a <laughs> tribute to Professor Menon. While Professor Menon's most significant contribution has been universally acknowledged to be to towards the reformation of legal education and pedagogy, I will humbly like to flag his most telling contribution to my own life. Having been his student, I have had the privilege of learning my greatest life lesson, quote, think like a lawyer, speak like a lawyer, unquote. When the entire world is getting devoured and swayed by the scourge of misinformation and the systematic loss of analytical abilities and critical thinking is conjuring them into believing in the hyper real and the commonsensical Professor Menon's prophetic words find a constant resonance inside me. As an academic, I definitely try to keep that flame of independent thinking alive in me. With this, I conclude the session. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kumar, sir, Menugopal, sir. Thank you very much. It has been an excellent session, and I congratulate the organizers and thank them as well. Thank you. With this, okay. I, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kumar. I conclude the session. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, sir.